2006 lacrosse season at UMass was very special. The Minutemen went all the way to the championship game. I'm Bob Beeler, along with the coach Greg Canella, and today we're going to look back at the 2006 season and find out what made it so special. And Greg, as we go back to the preseason, getting ready for the opening game against Hofstra, what were your expectations for your team this year? We had very high expectations coming off of the 2005 quarterfinal year, and we had great leadership in place with Jack Reed, Sean Morris, and Jake Dean. Uh, we're looking to fill some holes in the goal and the face-offs and, uh, and on attack. So, uh, but we've had very high expectations. We're looking forward to the season. Did you think you could make it all the way to the Final Four in the championship game? Uh, uh, in February, no. Uh, <laughs> later on in the year, we certainly felt we had an opportunity. What were the things, Greg, that came together for this team? As we're going to be taking a look at the highlights as the season builds. But what was better? Well, I think from the, from the first day, you know, our goaltending was better. Uh, you know, Doc Schneider played great. Uh, we, Jake Dean was superb on the faceoffs, And Jimmy Connolly on attack really stepped in and filled the void of Jeff Sawicki. And how about the support of the people? Because it seemed like as the season built, the team built, the support and the crowd built with a great turnout all the way down to Philadelphia for the championship game. Fantastic support. Uh, always parents, friends, uh, you know, a lot of the students here came down to the Final Four as well as the games here on campus. So, uh and we really enjoyed that, and certainly at the Final Four, we really felt the energy of the fans. Was there a game in particular that was a favorite of yours as we're going to be looking at the highlights of the game? Was there one or two that maybe stick out in your mind as your favorite game? Well, I think the first Hofstra, the game, the first game of the year against Hofstra was a super game, a great win for us uh, to catapult us into the year. And if you look back into the Fairfield win, uh, we came back from, you know, two goals down with less than a minute and scored three to win the game in regulation. So uh, I think those two things, uh, those two games were really ones that uh, kind of pushed us forward during the year. I was at the Fairfield game. I don't think you could uh, script that one. That, to me, is one of the more improbable in any game in any sport that I've seen. Never, never been involved in that, that side of, uh, the, you know, uh, of it. Uh, have lost a game like that, but uh, never won a game like that. It was really special. Well, there were so many special moments in the season. Let's take a look at the highlights right now of the 2006 Minutemen. where UMass tries to stay undefeated. Yeah, Greg Canella looking for career win 100. They've got two players you want to keep your eyes on. First, Jack Reed, great defender. And then Sean Morris, this guy is absolutely tearing it up on the attack. UMass coach Greg Canella a little apprehensive, looking for his 100th win in this game. His number seven ranked UMass hosting the Harvard Crimson. They come in at one and one. UMass three and oh, but it'll be Harvard to get the first goal of the game. Evan Calvert, first goal from Peter Doyle, and it's 1-0 early. About a minute later, it'll be junior attacker Greg Cohen, unassisted, 2-0. Harvard feeling like they could make some noise here against UMass. They would add to that 2-0 with a goal again by Greg Cohen, his third of the year, second straight. Now it's 3-0 Harvard. Pat Larman, the junior mini, man down for UMass, gets them on the board, the assist from Jim Connolly, and it is now three to one. It would be three to two before this guy, Sean Morris, to our time candidate, the flashiest player on that field, would take over and make it 3-3. Three, three. Then he would feed Koretsky right there to make it 5-3, and they would keep going before Harvard's Greg Cohen would make it a 5-5 game with that shot. They don't EMO. Morris finds number four, Rory Petrick, the sophomore mini from Saratoga Springs. 7-5, UMass with a two. Lead. They like to run. UMass gets it going, feeding Rory Petrick, getting his fourth of the year from Jake Dean. Jake Dean had a heck of a day, career best in ground balls and face-offs. Then Morris finds Clay Stabert, 12-7 is the way this one's going to end up. UMass undefeated. Let's go to the Northeast now, Q. The University of Massachusetts has owned that territory for a while. Loyola took the trip to play UMass. Yeah, and when you talk about UMass, you're talking about Sean Morris, the most exciting offensive player in college lacrosse. And you look at this series, 
UMass has never beaten Loyola in nine tries. Loyola's Greg Leonard scores right here, but UMass would win this game 14 to nine. The difference in this ball game, two five goal spurts by Greg Canella and the Minutemen, including this goal by Brett Garber. We're playing on Garber Field, that's his grandfather, and this one is all UMass. They beat Loyola for the first time in program history. Well, I'm excited for the guys because they fought today. Uh, they really did a good job of coming out hard, uh, playing for 60 minutes, and certainly against a good team as Loyola is, uh, you really have to do that. We came out here with a purpose. We all wanted to play hard, and uh, that's what we did. My defense played great, and uh, I just have to back him up, and they gave me shots I need to save. I'm very excited, very excited for us, our team. We uh, finally got the monkey off the back. We've lost a few games to them. It was nice to come out on top this time. Northeast had another big matchup as Hobart went to UMass. This promised to be a tough game. Yeah, UMass is an interesting team this year. Kind of tough to get a gauge uh, because they've played with some inconsistency. they got a freshman goalie, Doc Snyder, who's doing great, and they perhaps have the player of the year in Sean Morris. He's averaging 4.5 points per game. The Minutemen. Anytime they're playing in Garber Field, you better look out. Hobart comes to town. UMass looking to gain momentum. Brian Jacobina. He is a great two-end midfielder. Look at him shake and bake, stop on a dime, create the separation. UMass leads in this ballgame 1-0. And then on the extra man, Brett Garber, his grandfather, Dick Garber, the former coach that this field is named after. Watch the lefty, let it go. Boom, top shelf, he beats DeSantis. The mascot likes it, a 5-0 lead for UMass. Chris Davis for Hobart makes it respectable, but this one was all UMass, they win. 13 to 7. They play Georgetown on Saturday. A balanced effort for UMass. Doc Snyder, terrific between the pipes. Uh, Jake Dean at the faceoff, he was really dominant. And then you throw in Morris on the offensive end and Jack Reed at the defensive end. You'll get to see UMass this week right here on ESPNU against Georgetown. Welcome back to the ESPN Zone in Baltimore, Maryland. Lee Felsmo, Quinn Kessnick getting ready for another great matchup. This is an ECAC matchup and a critical game for both teams as UMass comes into Georgetown. Well, when I think of UMass, you got to think of Sean Morris. He's averaging over 4.5s per game on the offensive end. Then on defense, they got one of the game's best, Jack Reed. This guy is an absolute monster. Here it is, UMass at the Georgetown Hoyas. Buckle your chin strap. Georgetown in a nasty mood after losing to Loyola. We face off. It's UMass in Washington, D.C., battling Dave Yurk and the Hoyas. Georgetown gets in business first on the extra man. Great passing. Chase Gahan, 1-0. They led early. Greg Canella doesn't like what he's seeing. And then Peter Cannon drops it, picks it up, and without looking, beats Doc Snyder. 2-0 Georgetown, first quarter. Cannon never lost his cool, knew where the goal was every step of the way. Jack Reed, he's a monster, he's a beast. He's the best defender I've seen all season. The freshman, Jake Sanferton from Landon, 3-0, the Hoyas. And then UMass gets into business. How about that move by Fred Federico? Great pass down low to Clay Stabert, 3-1, second quarter. Sean Morrison finds Brett Garber down low. 3 to 2, UMass back in business. You can see a little hop in their step. Garrett Wilson, 34 seconds later, gives that Hoyas the two point spread. It's 4 to 2. Rich DeAndrea was outstanding, finished with 15 saves, including six in the second quarter. Physical contest, nice ball movement. Peter Cannon, the rocket, 5 to 2. And then Christian Truns would win the faceoff, makes it 6 to 2 before halftime. Hoyas milked that lead in the second half. But here comes UMass behind potential player of the year, Sean Morris. He's averaging four and a half points per game. There he is with the left-handed shot. UMass extra man to Pat Larman down low. Beats DeAndrea from close range. Six to four, third quarter, Georgetown leading. Watch this move by Brendan Cannon after the penalty had expired. Seven to four, Hoyas lead. Their defense did the rest. Very tough on the inside when they were covering anybody but that man right there, Sean Mars, Isolating, beats Ren Garnett, beats Rich DeAndrea, 7-5. This makes it 7-6 in the third quarter. Sean Morris single-handedly bringing UMass back in this game. Their defense tightened up. Watch the check, Jack Reed should be a first-team All-American, should be invited to the Tuartan Banquet. But Rich DeAndrea, seven fourth quarter saves. The Hoyas hold on, they get an insurance goal right here. Brendan Cannon with the pickup to Trevor Casey 
Dave Poliso does the dirty work. And there it is, Georgetown. They win eight to six. Their goalie, Rich DeAndre, one of the great stories this week. He was a backup all season long. Former starter, they moved him to long stick midfield, but Miles Cass has been injured, and DeAndrea was superb. 15 saves, Georgetown wins. UMass's miracle comeback of the season came against Fairfield on April 25th. Number seven minute men trailed the Stags all game until Brian Jacovina scored that goal right there to make it 6-5 with 103 left, beginning a miracle run of three goals in a 29 second span. Senior captain defensive specialist Jake Dean then grinds out this ground ball off the faceoff, leading to UMass's second score, which tied the game at 6-6. Sean Morris finishes off the feed right here with 49 seconds left in regulation as the senior All-American shows what makes him a special player. On the ensuing faceoff, once again, it was Jake Dean, the big story as the fans go wild there at Garber Field. Here's Dean on what will be the winning faceoff for UMass. Dean scraps the ball loose. All-American Jack Reed picks it up, brings the ball down for the Minutemen. After a loose ball, it's picked up. Rory Pedrick, the sophomore, feeds off to Jake Dean, who beats Sparefield goalie Mike Kruger right inside the post to give UMass the 7-6 lead with 34 seconds left in regulation. Those three goals came in a miracle span of 29 seconds. A miracle comeback for the Minutemen. UMass fended off Fairfield in the final seconds as the Stags had one final chance to tie the game after they had led for most of the 58 minutes at Garber Field on a midweek game. As UMass's de defense talks about the way to stop Fairfield and their top scorer, Greg Downing, who was shut out in this game by Jack Reed, UMass was able to come away with the big victory as the Minutemen improved to 9-3 on the season four and two in the ECAC with this huge clash. Fairfield was set up for one final shot and it's ripped forward and Doc Schneider, the freshman sensation, makes the save and lofts the ball in the air as UMass can celebrate its 7-6 victory, one of the most improbable comebacks of the season. Just this past weekend, and this team is on a roll. Five straight, the Orange have won. They're playing great offense. Their defense has surrendered 36 goals in their last three games. Let's see if they can buckle down against the Minutemen. Home as Syracuse, and the Orange would get off to a quick start. Nice job by Patrick Parrott, giving them a one nothing lead. This team didn't win in March, but they're winning a lot since then. And then Mike LaBelle gets it from Brett Buck. Could have been an easy day for the Orange, but that was not going to be the case. Four straight goals for Mass, starting with Clay Staber from Roy Pedrick. Now it's two to one. And then look at this, right down the middle from Fred, Fred Federico, and the coaching staff from Syracuse just couldn't believe it. Unbelievable! But Mass would continue. Sean Mars, the All-American, will get the ball back after giving it up, and he'll make a nice fake and hung up around the neck and still score left-handed. That makes it three to two, UMass lead. Still, with about a minute and a half to go in the first quarter, UMass would continue their offensive onslaught. This is Brett Garber from Brian Jacovina. Four to two, but then the second quarter would start. Buck two to get him off and rolling. Now it's three, four, before Matt Abbott would come down unassisted. Same spot to the goalies left. It would be all orange from here on out. We're going to show you the last goal here in the second quarter for us, Steve Panarelli. Off a loose ball, Panarelli unassisted. He'll give the orange the lead back at 5-4. to four. They would go on to win this one 12-7. to seven. Let's show you the last Syracuse goal before Connolly gets the last one for UMass. It's Kenny Nims behind the goal. The goalie is out pressuring. Nims sees Brian Crockett. Gives him a senior gift. It'll end up 12-7. Syracuse wins again. Welcome back to the ESPN Zone in Baltimore, Maryland. Quinn Kestick, our segment three starts off with Rutgers going to UMass. UMass saying goodbye to a very, very skilled group of senior players. Yeah, Sean Morris, a Tawarton finalist, and Jack Reed, their outstanding defenseman. He's the best one-on-one -on -one defender I've seen all year. Taking on a Rutgers team, Greg Havlicek, the senior goalie, his last game. 
A disappointing season for Rutgers. They're not eligible for the postseason. Meanwhile, Sean Morris and UMass in need of a win to strengthen their case. And he had a hat trick. Sean Morris, a Tawarton finalist. You can expect to see him in D.C. at the banquet because of plays like that. Left-handed, behind the back, Morris had a hat trick. UMass wins this ball game 10 to 5. And they garner a bid into the NCAA tournament in May. Anything is possible. Uh, it's a great time of year. Uh, when you get to play in May, your seniors uh, really have a sense of urgency. They don't want their season to end, but uh, you, you know you reap the awards and the benefits from uh, working hard all year and uh, playing together as a team. So it's uh, it's great to be able to get there. UMass will play at Cornell in a very intriguing matchup. UMass, an up-tempo team. Cornell, a slow-down defensive team, should be a great game. Well, it'll be real interesting to our time, time because you got Sean Morris and Joe Walters, and they are really standing toe to toe right now. But UMass wins this game. Welcome back to the ESPN Zone in Baltimore. Leith Elsmo and Quinn Pesnick toil across across weekly show, and the playoffs are underway. Key now we go to Cornell, number six seeded team. In men's Division One, UMass comes in with a great season under their belt, and this was maybe the best game of the opening round. Yeah, I think when I look at UMass, I see Greg Cannella as the coach, but anytime they got 10 guys out there, they're going to have the two best players on the field, Jack Reed on defense and Sean Morris on offense, and that's why UMass is so dangerous. Champions of the Ivy League from Central New York, Cornell taking on UMass. David Mitchell, the lefty from Canada. Nice little outside left-handed shot right there. Big red up one nothing, And then Mitchell, similar move, kicks it to Joe Belukas and the big senior. Beats Doc Snyder, 2-0 Cornell. They were on a roll early. Mitchell then would score in a nice little pass from Seibold, the freshman. 3-0 halfway through the first quarter. Looks like Cornell's going to dominate. But here comes Sean Mark. Five-minute mark of the first quarter. Scores the Minutemen's first goal. And then Jim Connolly does the same. Two isolation goals from behind the net. 3-2. Pat Larman then takes the feed from Sean Mars. 3-3 score, UMass has fought back still in the second quarter. We're tied up. Cornell known for their unselfish offense. Casey Lewis to Eric Pittard. To Derek Haswell, nice little goal there by the Big Red. Jeff Cambroni always doing such a great job in their offensive coordination. Rory Pedrick for UMass, looks inside. It's Andrew Recchioni, he beats Matt McMonigle, Cornell's goalie, and then Sean Mars gives UMass, their first lead of the game at 5-4. Another ISO, you got a double team mark. Great little pass in front. Oh, McMonagall, what a great save from in front. Critical momentum swing in this game. Casey Lewis in the third quarter. Ties the score up at five apiece. Little inside roll, he beats Schneider. And then Sean Mars finds Clay Stabert in front, 6-5. Greg Canella and the boys from Western Massachusetts, they lead this ball game. Sean Krieger to Clay Stabert, to Morris in transition, up to Jamie Yeaman, seven to five. UMass lead, end to end action, over 5,000 fans up at Cornell for this, this game. Max Seibold makes it seven to six at the end of the third quarter. UMass clings to a one goal lead. But in the fourth, David Mitchell ties it up, 12.30 to go, and this is headed towards potentially overtime. What a scrappy fourth quarter we had. Not a clean game, not a perfect game. A lot of turnovers, especially in the clearing. And Brian Giacovina then would score for UMass. This kid has been Mr. Everything for the Minutemen. When you need a big goal, he's there. He makes it eight to seven. UMass takes the lead with five minutes to go. And there is Giacovina on the sideline. Cyball pops the next face off, jams it down low to Eric Pitter. Next thing you know, seven seconds later, this ball game is tied up in the fourth. 23 seconds later, Seibold scores unassisted. This kid's trying to take this game over. Cornell has the lead, 9-8. to eight. But Fred Federico, you talk about a kid with some guts, isolates right-handed, ties the score up. 3.46 to go. Jeff Cambroni can't believe it. 2.34 to go. Saber Tamaris to Recchioni. UMass wins this one, 10-9. Congratulations, Greg Canella and the Minutemen. You know, Quint, when you watched that game as I did in Cornell, you got the feeling that Cornell maybe had the bigger athletes. They were going to win the game somehow, but UMass kept coming back and doing everything.
had to do to keep the lead. Yeah, that's a team with a lot of guts, a lot of heart, and I give them credit. You know, anytime you got Sean Morris on offense, you're in the game, and what he did in that middle third of the game, when he had two goals and three assists during their run, that was spectacular. And then, of course, the freshman goalie, Doc Schneider, came up huge when he had to. Well, hi, everybody. The UMass lacrosse team will head to Stony Brook, New York on Saturday for the Elite Eight of the NCAA Tournament. The Minutemen will take on Hofstra in that game. And as Dave Guthrow tells us tonight, the stakes have never been higher for the men's lacrosse program. The last five years have been a golden age for the UMass lacrosse program. Four trips to the Elite Eight of the NCAA Tournament, including a trip to this year's national quarterfinals on Saturday. Really hard work is, is what it is, and guys that are willing to work hard and be unselfish, uh, put aside any personal accolades for the betterment of the team. Hard work. These, uh, these programs over the last five years have all worked really hard. Uh, the guys before us really put a pedigree down of you know, working hard day in and day out all year, and you, know, you reap rewards for the work and effort you put in. And, uh, we've tried to follow that along as a uh, senior class this year, and uh, so far it's worked out well for us. Saturday's opponent is a familiar one for UMass. The bad news is that Hofstra is ranked second in the country and have only lost once this year. The good news is that their one loss was to UMass in February. And the Minutemen have beaten Hofstra the last five times the teams have played. We were fortunate to beat them uh, early in the season, but you know they went on to win 17 straight. So it's definitely going to be a totally different team. Uh, we're a little familiar with the personnel, which I think is going to help, and uh, I think we got a good game plan in place. So we tried to focus this week on playing the game itself and then not beyond it and not what happened last week. So uh, we're concentrating on Hofstra right now, and you know we would be great over at, you know uh, the number two team in the country. UMass and Hofstra have played each other five times in the past four years, but no game has been bigger than Saturday's. A Minutemen win would send the UMass program to a place place it's never been in the 52-year history of the program. That place, the Final Four. It'd be huge. Uh, something I, you know, every lacrosse player I think dreams of that's been to the Final Four, and it's something that I've always wanted to do, and that's why I came to UMass. I've had two chances, you know, previously in my career, and uh, this is my last shot, and uh, it's everything I've worked for. Uh, all the time I've spent in the gym and on the field and with my teammates, uh, this is what we've worked for, and to finally get it would be a goal I just realized when I was big. One of the big events in your life. Reporting at UMass, I'm Dave Guthrow, ABC 40 Sports. Now let's move on to the second game in Stony Brook. UMass taking on Hofstra. Hofstra's only lost this year to the UMass Minutemen. Yeah, back in February, a cold, chilly day at Garber Field. This scenario, this game is wide open. It's UMass and Hofstra, two teams who have never been to the national semifinals. The magical season for Hofstra. Quarterfinals, they've never been to the NCAA Final Four. Jim Trubig. 1-0, Flying Dutchman, now known as the Pride. 12.53 to go in the first. Chris Unterstein, what a great player. He's a Tuaraton finalist. You see him isolating against Jack Reed. Rory Pedrick, shot goes wide to Clay Sabert. Tamaris back to Sabert. Nice little give and go. UMass in business, they trail 3-1. to one. And then Jim Connolly, three seconds to go in the first quarter. Watch the goalie, Matt Southern. You can't do that, he's caught out of the net. 3-2. At the end of the first quarter, a tactical era as Greg Canella smiling on the Minuteman sideline. Second quarter, Chris Unterstein takes the feed in transition. They don't pick him up, and he scores 17 seconds into that second stanza. And then Unterstein does it again, 5-2, but he suffered a concussion on this play. His head hit the turf, and he was not the same. Trubig gives Hofstra a 7-4 lead at half. And watch Jack Reed, though. Doc Schneider should have made that save, and you watch Reed support his goalie. Third quarter, Jim Conley beats Matt Southerd. The goalie comes off the pipe and pays for it, 7-5. Then on the extra man, Hofstra outside shot. The rebound, that's the freshman, Tom Dooley. 8-5, the men in yellow lead by three. Unterstein back from injury makes it 9-5. 6.48 to go in the third. This is the save of the week. One of the best you'll see all time, Doc Schneider. Can you believe it? Diving stop, what a play. Hofstra then with a 10-5 lead with nine minutes to go, but here comes UMass. Jamie Yeaman, Clay Staber, 10-6, it's a four goal lead. And then Morris scores, makes it 10-7. Hofstra clinging to a three goal lead with 7.27 to go. Jim Connolly, 10-8, six minutes and 29 seconds to go. Is there enough time for UMass to make the comeback? Andrew Recchioni, who had such a big goal against Cornell last week, scores 10 with less than a minute to go. 
time running out on UMass. Jake Dean is flattened. Here comes Rory Pedrick. He plants, he stings one top shelf. We are tied with less than a minute to go in the ball game. Watch it again, Pedrick from the outside. Neither team has been to the NCAA Final Four. The season at stake. Here's Dave Ryan. Garber feet in front, Conley scores! Jam Conley has won it for UMass! They're going to the national semifinals for the first time in school history! It's over! Well, hi everybody. Tomorrow morning, the UMass lacrosse team will play in its first ever Final Four. The Minutemen will take on Maryland in front of 50,000 fans in Philadelphia, not to mention millions more watching on ESPN2. Now, this is an amazing achievement, and as Dave Guthrow tells us tonight, accomplishing the improbable has become UMass's trademark. Kaiser, little leaping shot there. Score! Last Saturday, with under 10 minutes to go in the national quarterfinal, the UMass lacrosse team trailed heavily favored Hofstra 10 to 5. It appeared the Minutemen's dream of a trip to the Final Four would fall short. But six unanswered goals later, UMass had captured a stunning 11 to 10 win and further cemented themselves as the best team in school history. Nobody on the team gave up. We were all just kind of waiting for things to start going our way, and nobody gave up. And, uh, you know, that's just something that's amazing to me still. As a defenseman, we told our offense, you guys score five goals in eight minutes, we'll hold them to no goals. And we did that. We held our end of the deal. They held their end of the deal. They put us into OT and then just went from there. Where UMass will go from there is tomorrow's Final Four for the first time in the 52-year history of the program. A tradition this year's team has certainly added to, and a legacy the Minutemen hold dear. A rich history that was on full display in the game-winning goal against Hofstra, when Brett Garber fed Jim Conley for the score. Garber to Conley, uh, you know, obviously the father of our program, uh, and Dick Garber and Ted Garber being a head coach here, now his son gets the assist, and, and Jimmy Connolly, his brother, you know, uh, Ryan played for us last year, and you know, last four years, and uh, dad was a captain in 69 on an undefeated team, so uh, I think it's important for them to know the tradition and the history, and, and also it will be important for them to understand that they've created a little bit of their own. And we have tons of alumni emailing you, calling you, they were all at the game, just supporting you, so it's really good. It's a great step for UMass and a great step for our program. Which has led the Minutemen to dream about the next step. Two wins this weekend will allow UMass to bring home its first national title in program history. That would be amazing. Two more wins, a national championship. That would just be fantastic. I, I wouldn't even believe it if it happened, but uh, you know, I want to be part of it, and I'd love the opportunity, but we got to win this weekend, and that's all I could think about is uh, this one win. Two more wins would be amazing. I, you know, I can't even imagine what it would be like right now to be a national champ, but we got to focus on Maryland. They're, gonna, they're a next step, and we're going to be a tough team to beat. And I think they have an opportunity here. They know they have a really good opportunity going down to Philadelphia, so they want to take advantage of it. The first matchup is UMass, the Cinderella team, against Maryland, a team that's really been about the second best team all year long. Is this a tough mental game for Coach Cottle? Well, anytime you're in a national semifinal, you got to think you're going to be fired up and ready to play. Maryland coming off a great victory over Princeton. They look sharp. They look energetic on defense. Meanwhile, UMass beats Hofstra. They come from behind five goals down. It's their second consecutive upset. How much gas is left in the tank for UMass? Let's take a look at it. We'll go to that first quarter. UMass taking on Maryland in the biggest arena of lacrosse. Ideal conditions in Philadelphia. Championship weekend, Harry Alford of Maryland, Doc Schneider, the goalies who will do battle, and we are underway in semifinal number one. Maryland draws first blood, Xander Ritz isolating from behind the net, beats Schneider. Dave Cottle's got a lot to cheer about, one nothing Terps. And then Jim Connolly, the finalizer mover, tied up at one apiece, nice little bounce shot. Gets this ball to skim off the natural grass surface, one apiece, then it's Morris to Pedrick. Rory Pedrick gives UMass a two to one lead. A little behind the back shot off the nifty feed from Sean Mark. Ritz misses the net. He's jacked up by Jack Reed, UMass's big, strong defender. Then Brian Jacobina robbed by Harry Alford. The outlet pass to Ryan Lang. Nice look to Ryan Clark, bouncer. It's in the back of the net. We're tied up at two with 129 to go in the first. 86 mile an hour shot. Sean Morris of UMass, 66 points, third in the NCAA, isolating from up top. Gives UMass a 3-2 lead. Watch this play again as they create some misdirection. They give him a seam. 
They give him some space to operate, and he can use his speed. The Minutemen leading by one with 13.36 to go before halftime. Then Billy McGlone freelancing in traffic. Comes in behind the back shot, off the iron. Greg Canella addressing his team. Great defense they're playing right now in the second quarter. Really shutting down Maryland's midfield of McGlone and Healy. And you see why. Healy with the outside shot on the run. He's taken down hard. Dave Cottle trying to get some offense going for Maryland. Sean Morris off a big upset performance against Hofstra and Cornell. Maryland fans waiting for their team to wake up. Third quarter action. Morris. Stop and go quickness. Look at him create the separation. He beats off her down low. UMass a two goal lead. It's four to two. The fans came in from Amherst, from New York, from Long Island, from all across the Eastern Seaboard, and they were excited. Reverse angle shows Mars just too quick to be covered. Here he is again, spinning this time. Watch the defense. He draws four Terrapin defenders. Jack Avina gets hit by the shot, picks it up, and puts it by Harry Alford. The Minutemen up by three. Watch the replay again. The shot will be blocked by Jacobina himself, but all the Maryland players were upfield trying to cover Sean Morris. UMass up by three. Next faceoff, Jake Dean, the senior, pops it clean. Ten seconds later, he gets another rebound in front. UMass up by four. A huge play in this ball game. Dean wins the draw and scores himself. The Minutemen now up by four and playing terrific defense. Can UMass pull the upset? They're up by four as we go to the fourth quarter. Terps wake from their slumber early fourth quarter. Mike Phipps overplayed by Reed. The over the head check and Phipps multiple fakes. Pucks that one in the corner. Six to three, Terps down by three. Then they cut it to a two goal game. It's Max Ritz again, inverting from, from behind the goal. Nice little move, he's checked, but the shot goes by Doc Schneider. We've got a new ball game, fourth quarter, 6-4. Then in transition, Jake Dean ahead to Clay Stabert. They've got a three on two, down low to Jim Connolly. He beats Alford to the near side. Watch his shot again, not much goal to shoot at, but Connolly, the freshman, so impactful in the Hofstra game. Terps pull within two, Dan Groot makes it seven to five. The assist from Max Ritz, 10-10 to go in this ball game. Key play right here, Sean Morris. Three goal lead for Massachusetts with 6.33 to go. Mars showcasing his speed, his explosiveness, and his finishing ability. He finished with a hat trick and one assist. Sean Mars shows why he is a Tawarton finalist. Greg Canella then trying to hold off Maryland, and he does. UMass, they're in the national title game for the first time in school history. They win eight to five. We had a great plan uh, defensively. Jason Miller did a great job with our guys all week. They executed the plan. We kind of kept Maryland off balance, I thought. They really went to the invert in the second half. Uh, this is a great performance by our guys. You got to give them all the credit. Well, congratulations to UMass. Their first ever semifinal appearance, they parlayed it into a game on Monday in the national championship game. Sean Morris, three goals, one assist. Doc Schneider, 15 saves. And Greg Canella, a defensive gem. You know, one guy I want to talk about is number 44, Van Voigt, who was off the team with an injury for four games. He comes back, and really part of the big story here was 44 and 42 as they bounced up and shut down McGlone and Healy. Yeah, all season long, Maryland's been seeing the polls cover their midfield unit. Uh, this time it works. Last week, Van Voigt uh, shut down uh, Ethan Iannucci from Hofstra, basically shut him off, uh, he and Krieger. This week, they say, hey, you got to go up top and cover one of those middies. So showing their versatility was so key. Welcome back to the ESPN Zone in Baltimore. It's championship weekend on Toyota Lacrosse Weekly. Lee Felsmo, Quinn Kesnick. We're moving into the Monday final at the Lincoln, Philadelphia. It's UMass, the Cinderella story, the feel-good story of the year in Division I lacrosse against Virginia, the undefeated offensive powerhouse. A couple things to keep your eye on in terms of storyline. Sean Morris for UMass, how impactful can he be? Virginia, team speed, passing, and shooting. They've been unstoppable. Can UMass shut down the Cavaliers? <laughs> The Lincoln, Philadelphia, 47,000 fans, a championship day record. Memorial Day, a gorgeous hot Monday. Virginia strikes first, Kyle Dixon. Great feed to Matt Poske, one nothing. Virginia, Poske, and Dixon, both seniors. And then here comes Clay Staber, great inside roll against Foster Gilbert. Look at the little head and shoulder fake right there. We're tied at one apiece. But Poske from Danny Gladding makes it two to one. Cavaliers, they're known for their first quarter outburst. Jack Reed, big hit on Matt Ward, then in transition, Smith to Rubior, to Gladding, Virginia runs with the best of them. 
Matt Ward makes it 4-1 at the end of the first quarter. The Cavaliers in control. UMass being outshot 19-7. Kip Turner doing such a fine job robbing Jim Connolly. But in the second quarter, the Minutemen would win four or five face-offs. And then Sean Marsh would get things going. Nifty little pass in front. Rory Pedrick. Ball's in the back of the net, 4-2. Cavs lead by one, early stage of second quarter. Then Jake Dean, 10 seconds later, wins the draw, carries in. He scored in the semifinals, and he also has a goal in the national championship game. The senior from Annapolis makes it a 4-3 ball game. Matt Ward then, left-handed, unassisted, takes Jack Reed to the rack. Virginia fans can celebrate. They're up 5-3. And then Jim Connolly and Jamie Yeaman. 5-4 at the break. 27,000 fans and about 90% of them are rooting for UMass and you can see them feed off that emotion. How about that goal by Jake Dean off the faceoff 10 seconds after Pedrick had scored? We've got ourselves a ball game. Quite the momentum shift for me was in the first part of that quarter when the lead was there for Virginia. They had their first possession, a seven shot possession where they didn't get a goal. Then it went to the other end two quick goals for UMass and they're back in. Yeah, but still a time bomb because Virginia taking tons of shots. Matt Ward, their best player, has 11 shots already. He's got two goals, but if he continues to get those kind of shots, it's, it's going to be lights out for UMass. Let's go to quarter number three after the halftime speeches from each coach and see how these teams do in the 100 degree heat. After halftime, Virginia out shooting UMass 29 to 18, but Brett Garber, the grandson of the great Dick Garber, former head coach at UMass from 1955 to 1990 makes it a tie ball game, 5-5, but here comes Matt Ward. He would finish with five goals, that assist from Thompson, and then fellow senior Kyle Dixon gets on the board. But Yeaman from Morris, 7-6 midway through the third quarter. Still anybody's ball game. UMass showing so much heart, so much tenacity. Watch the replay of that. Morris draws the double team. Yeaman with a terrific cut. But Virginia would score eight of the next nine goals. Matt Poske on the extra man with the hat trick. Kyle Dixon, 9-6, unassisted. Then Pasque from Rubior. Pasque's fourth goal of the game, 10-6, late third quarter. And then in transition, Ricky Smith to Matt Ward, his fourth, 11-6, fourth quarter. Thompson inside, more Pasque, 12-6. Pasque's got five. And then Ward says, hey, I want five myself. He takes that Thompson feed, 13-6. The route was on. Ben Rubio finished with the last two goals for Virginia. They win the national title. Lights Quint and give credit where credit's due for that UMass Cinderella team. Doc Schneider had a heck of a game. Yeah, yeah. serious. Uh, uh, just an amazing performance. 17 saves in the finals. Uh, some low saves, some kick saves, some great jobs on some angle shots. And he was energetic. Bright, bright future. Give a lot of credit to their coaching staff, Jake Kuhn, their assistant uh, coach, specializing in goalies, and Schneider. Best goal at UMass since Ocasio. What a great season for the Minutemen in 2006, going all the way to the championship game. And Greg, those highlights were so fun to relive again. You had so many guys contribute, and I think that was one of the things that made this team special. It wasn't just one or two players, it was a team effort. Most definitely. A team effort all the way through. Uh, Great uh, leadership in every class, you know, from freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior classes. Uh, those guys really worked hard throughout the year. They, they earned what they got, you know, in, in the end. And, uh, you know, I'm really proud of the, the entire team this year. What was the experience like at the Final Four playing before nearly 50,000 people, national television? Uh, did it feel different than playing a regular game? Uh, certainly it did. Of course it did. Uh, but I, I think our guys did a great job, and in particular our captains did a great job of keeping our guys composed and relaxed uh, to be able to play at a high level. Uh, when you get on that stage, sometimes people play a little bit differently. We played the way that we prepared for that week. Why was this team such a good come-from-behind team? I mean, it almost seemed like, you know, somebody gets ahead by a couple goals, and I'm like, hey, that's exactly where UMass wants them. They're going to come from behind and win this game. You had a bunch of guys that uh, really had a lot of heart. Um, you know, it was a never, you know, never give up attitude. Um, you know, Jake Dean epitomized that throughout the year. And guys like Jack Reed, Brian Jacovina, you know, those people really pushing forward. And, you know, in the end, the team really believed in each other and trusted each other out there on the field. And that's, you know, obviously, in athletics, that's what counts the most. Where did you see this team really come together? Was there a game in the middle of the season that maybe you thought this team could make a run like this? Well, I, th I think it was after the Syracuse game where we were, we were disappointed with our loss. Uh, we were up in the game, early in the game, again, and, and Syracuse came back on us and beat us. So I think after that, the guys realized, hey, we have to refocus here. 
Uh, we're going to go beat Rutgers and then uh, hopefully get into the tournament. I think that was it. And then you got into the tournament, and you had to do it on the road. You got assigned to go to Cornell, and then basically you had to play a road game against Hofstra, too, to get to the Final Four. Yeah, you know, two really tough games for us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Cornell was two or three during the year, as was Hofstra. Uh, again, you know, going up to Cornell, a lot of character for our guys mm -hmm. to go up there and, and, and play well. And then going down to Long Island, we have some Long Island guys, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the program. But... Uh, Hofstra had a big following there as well as we did, mm -hmm. uh, but another tough game as you mentioned. When you look back on the 2006 season, what are you going to remember the most? I remember the guys, uh, you know, the effort that they put forth throughout the year. You know, this is a process. It, it begins, you know, in September and it goes all the way through May, and, and that process was really enjoyable for me, and hopefully it was for the guys. Finally, the senior class. Uh, you can, I don't think you can get to this level without having an outstanding senior class. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts of them. Uh, again, great leadership, and you look at uh, Clay Stabert and Jamie Yamin, they had the best years of their careers here at UMass, which we want every senior to have. Uh, and you look at Jack and Sean and Jake, everybody knows about those guys. Uh, you know, just a super effort for those guys, uh, putting forth, uh, you know, everything that they had. You know, they really gave back to the team as much as they could. We talked a lot about the players, but you had a great staff that helped you as well. Unbelievable staff. Jake Kuhn, uh, Jason Miller led the defense. Jake Kuhn really has developed, you know, Jonathan Schneider. Uh, but, you know, when people talk about our Maryland game, the semifinal game, it was an 8-5 game, and to hold a team like Maryland to five goals is really a feather in uh, Jason Miller's hat. You know, he really did a good job with it. This may be the first of a long run, but the first year getting to the Final Four, I have to believe, would be the most special. Yeah, it is. Uh, hopefully we can repeat it. It's not going to be It's not going to be easy. Uh, it won't be even easy to get back to the NCAA tournament. So uh, we'll approach it like we do every year. We'll get ourselves ready and... Uh, push forward. Well, Greg, thanks a lot for being with us here and helping us relive the outstanding moments of 2006 getting all the way to the championship game in Philadelphia. It's been a pleasure sitting here. Congratulations to you, your coaches, and your team. Thank you very much, Bob. For head coach Greg Canella, I'm Bob Beeler. Thanks for taking a look back at the exciting 2006 season.